Hi, my name is Rich Harrington, and today I'm going to walk you through the process and talk about some of the policies associated with registering your drone or quadcopter. We've got a lot of things to cover, and I just want to explain some of the new changes that have come about in the United States, as well as the actual mechanics of properly getting your device registered. So we're going to take a look at drones and quadcopters, but really this applies to any model aircraft. And this is in particular focused on the unmanned aircraft systems registration practices. Now this new procedure was recently unveiled and there's a lot of things to cover. So we'll make sure that we talk about the requirements that have been recently put forth for the unmanned aircraft systems. We'll talk about which devices are affected by these new rules and talk about the registration and marking requirements for small unmanned aircrafts that are all a part of what's being referred to as the interim final rule. And lastly, I'll take you through the registration process. Now, before we jump into the actual mechanics, I just wanna take a second to give you a little bit about my background and my involvement with quadcopters or drones. I am the publisher of the website photofocus.com where every day we focus on ideas and inspirations for the photography community, but I've also written more than 40 books for photographers and video professionals, as well as authored more than 100 classes about things like design, photography, and video production. I work with folks like the National Association of Broadcasters on their post-production world conference, and I enjoy taking photographs and being a quadcopter hobbyist. What I am not, however, is a lawyer, a pilot, or an employee of the Federal Aviation Administration. The reason why I bring that up is while I truly enjoy this and have been an early adopter of flying drones and quadcopters to get great shots, I am not a professional pilot, nor do I fly professionally. I'm focusing on the rules that affect hobbyists, and later on in this video, I'll walk you through the different guidelines that apply depending upon how you use a quadcopter. All right, let's jump right into the new rules. So recently, a set of guidelines came out that are being referred to as the small UAS registration rule. And these rules will affect those who want to fly in the United States, whether you're a citizen or not. The FAA announced these rules on December 14th. Although there was a bit of public comment and discussion leading up to these, this was the first unveiling. And the registration process began on December 21st. Now, you can find the press release available on the Federal Aviation Administration website and take a look at some of the other details that are covered inside of it. U.S. Transportation Secretary Anthony Fox said, Make no mistake, unmanned aircraft enthusiasts are aviators, and with that title comes a great deal of responsibility. He went on to say, Registration gives us an opportunity to work with these users to operate their unmanned aircraft safely. And then said, I'm excited to welcome these new aviators into the culture of safety and responsibility that defines American innovation. Well, that's definitely a politician talking, but that's okay. What's happening here is the FAA is focusing on getting these devices registered. There's been a lot of incidents in the news of people flying unsafely and a lot of public concern. Like it or not, the FAA has taken the stance that they have the rights to regulate this in the United States, that they're concerned about the airspace. And as such, they want to have a registration so that people who are operating unsafely can be located in the event of a crash, and that they can use this database of registered users to put out educational programs to improve the overall safety. Now, I am not a lawyer. And you are welcome, of course, to talk to yours, but they are taking a pretty firm stance that this is a requirement. So why these new rules? Well, first up, the FAA estimates that in 2015, there's going to be about 1.6 million small unmanned aircraft intended to be used as model aircraft. And that's a lot of units being sold in one year. This rapid proliferation of new small unmanned aircraft systems will bring a lot of owners and operators who are completely new to aviation, who probably lack an understanding of the national airspace and the safety requirements that are involved in operating there. You see, that airspace is operated with other vehicles, such as large commercial flight, and there's definitely a concern there, as well as safety issues, power lines, utilities. There have been instances of quadcopters getting in the way of firefighting activities. These events have been pretty far and few isolated, but it's still important to note that the FAA is taking action. 
Essentially, they assert that registration will provide a means by which they can identify any small aircraft that are involved in an incident or an accident, and this will allow them to have some accountability or responsibility. This means that this will allow the FAA to also educate all owners of these devices on safety requirements. Now, if you take a look at their estimates for the sales forecast, you'll notice that they've identified really steady growth through the year 2020. They've also seen that they're going to have a lot of commercial non-model aircraft. Now, there have been some commercial aircraft identified already, but those have required exemptions. The new rules that we're talking about today initially only affect hobbyists, but during 2016 will be rolled out to allow for commercial registration as well. So you see the total numbers there. These are the FAA's estimates of what's happening with small unmanned aircraft systems. And if you take a look at these, that's quite a bit when you talk about millions sold. Now you might be wondering, who do these rules apply to? I did some digging into the regulations and this is what I found. First up, any owner of an aircraft that weighs more than 0.55 pounds and less than 55 pounds is required to register. That half a pound weight means that many of the toys are not part of this requirement. This includes any payloads as well, if you're attaching a camera or using any other device mounted to your drone. The total weight is what's being considered. Registration is a statutory requirement that applies to all aircraft. This essentially means that a permit or a license is required by law to allow you to engage in a certain activity. Now, if you have previously operated an unmanned aircraft, such as a model aircraft or a drone or quadcopter, before December 21st, 2015, you have to register no later than February 19th. This is essentially giving you 60 days to come into compliance. Anybody else who buys a new aircraft after the December 21st date when the registration site is opening must register before they take their first flight outdoors. This means that the burden is on time of flight, so you want to get the device registered before you go and fly outside. Owners will either need to use the paper-based process, which is a bit slower, or the new streamlined web-based system, which we'll take a look at a little bit later in this class. If you are using the web-based system, the person registering needs to be at least 13 years old. If the person who is owning the device is not 13, they'll need a parent or a sibling or someone else in their family to register it for them. Now, there's some confusion over the status of hobbyist versus professional and how these rules apply. Initially, the focus is on hobbyist, but we'll talk about the differentiation more in just a second. If you are considered using the aircraft for hobby or recreation use, you'll only have to register once and you could put the same identification number on all of your devices. This registration is valid for three years and will need to be renewed in order to keep flying your device. If you sell or get rid of a device, you could then deregister it and place the burden on the new owner to register the device before flying. The online registration system doesn't currently support the registration of small UAS for any other purpose other than hobby or recreation. For example, if you're using this in connection with a business. However, this is expected to change and the FAA is going to enhance the system that should allow the registration during the spring of 2016. Now, those policies seem pretty straightforward, but obviously there's a lot of questions about the smaller details or nuances. The FAA has posted some questions and answers and I dug through and picked out the ones that I thought were most useful to a typical flyer. What are some of those things that are really standing out? Well, let's break them down. First up, what is the definition of a UAS? Is it different from a drone? And according to the FAA, a UAS is an unmanned aircraft system. A drone and a UAS are the same for purposes of registration. Does the FAA have the authority to require registration of UAS used by modelers and hobbyists? Well, there's been a lot of uproar on this, and some of the modelers and people who've been flying model aircraft for years don't think that these rules apply to them. Again, I am not a lawyer, and there have been past procedures in place that allowed them to be exempt from these rules. 
Going forward, however, the FAA has decided that they really can't tell the difference between things that use one propeller or two versus four or six. They're putting all of these devices under one classification and requirement. So does the FAA have authority? Well, they feel they do. By statute, all aircraft are required to register. Congress has defined aircraft to include UAS, regardless of whether they are operated by modelers and hobbyists. So according to the FAA's stance, they feel that they have this authority and they intend to prosecute if you don't follow. What's the penalty for failing to register? Well, here's where it gets pretty steep. Now, this isn't to say that they're going to necessarily enforce this, but the potential penalty states that failure to register an aircraft may result in regulatory and criminal sanctions. The FAA may assess civil penalties up to $27,500, and criminal penalties include fines of up to $250,000 and or imprisonment for up to three years. Those penalties are pretty steep. Now, I anticipate that these will be used when people are operating drones in an unsafe way and haven't registered. But the FAA is taking a pretty strong stance here that they want everybody to register their UAS systems. Will an operator be required to have proof of registration while operating the UAS? The answer is yes, you'll be required to have your FAA registration certificate in your possession when operating your unmanned aircraft. We'll talk more specifically what that means, if it's a printed copy or an electronic copy, a little bit later after we walk you through registration. Why do I need to register? Federal law requires aircraft registration. Registration helps us ensure safety for you, others on the ground, and manned aircraft. UAS pose new security and privacy challenges and must be traceable in the event of an incident. It will also help us enable the return of your UAS should it be lost. The stance there is that through registration, they have a database of users, making it easier to educate them as well as hold people accountable. Now, obviously with the government getting more involved in this process, there are a lot of people who have legitimate concerns. Again, I am not a lawyer. You are free to talk to yours and see if you'd like to take the federal government on, but they are taking a pretty strong stance here and I want you to be aware of what they are asking. Where can I find information about operating my UAS safely? You can find safety and operating guidance on the internet at faa.gov slash UAS slash model aircraft. The Unmanned Aircraft Systems website contains important safety guidance as well as other facts and information. If you visit that website, you'll see there's a lot of general guidelines, including how to operate as a model aircraft operator, as well as links to other things and general advice. It also includes information if you need to go about getting your device professionally registered, as well as the 333 exemption and the test sites that are needed if you want to fly professionally. Which devices need to register? There is a legitimate question, does your device need to be registered? Well, this really depends because the devices fall into two different classes. Devices like this, many people think of as expensive toys, but they cross a certain size and are seen as being beyond a true toy. The little tiny ones that you might get for a kid or play with indoors are generally considered toys. Devices up to 55 pounds fall under these new requirements for registration. And if you're flying something over 55 pounds, then you may need to go through something much more robust for professional certification. So most devices that are classified as toys are not affected. If it weighs less than 250 grams or 0.55 pounds, you don't have to register the device. Most toys the FAA has identified as having a purchase price of $100 or less, and again, weigh less than half a pound or so. You can find specific information by visiting the FAA website, and I've provided a short link here. bit.ly slash toy drones will take you right to a guideline that has some samples. Now, these can be summarized as such. Here are some specific toys, and it gives you the sample weights. You'll notice that a wide range of devices are out there, and these are just breaking down if something is required to be registered. You'll notice that there's a wide range of sizes, but many that fall beneath the 0.55 pound weight limit, and therefore don't need to be registered. On the other hand, all other UAS must register. If the UAS weighs less than 55 pounds, 
and more than 0.55 pounds on takeoff, then it needs to be registered. This includes anything that's on board or attached to the device, including cameras. And if you're going to operate it outdoors in the national airspace, then you must register. The aircraft may register under the new web-based registration system, which we'll show you in just a moment, which makes the process much easier. An unmanned aircraft system includes the communication links and components that control the small unmanned aircraft along with any other elements needed to safely operate the drone. For example, paper airplanes, toy balloons, frisbees, and other items are not connected to a control system. Therefore, they don't need to be registered. If it has a remote control unit, it does need to be registered. In other words, if you don't have something like this, this is a brand new controller unit for the DJI Phantom, well, you don't probably need to register. You need some sort of remote controlled unit that allows you to operate the device. Just because something floats in the air, like a balloon, doesn't mean that it's required to be registered. Now, if your UAS is tethered, for example, uses a cabled connected device, or untethered like a wireless one, both are required to be registered. If you fly in your backyard, you still need to register. If you only fly indoors, you do not have to register. This is all about the national airspace and respecting that airspace where other vehicles operate. If you only fly your UAS indoors, you do not have to register. Even if your drone is homemade, it still needs to be registered if they meet the weight criteria. Again, just over half a pound and under 55 pounds. Now, there are a wide range of devices, and you'll notice that pretty much the entire product line from companies like 3D Robotics, DJI, Helimax, Hubsan, Parrot, and others fall under the weight requirements that mean registration is necessary. If you owned a drone before December 21st, 2015, you must register it by February 19th, 2016 to be in compliance with the regulations. On the other hand, if you buy a new unit after December 21st, 2015, you must register it before your first flight. Any UAS that are 55 pounds or more must be registered using the current paper-based system. You can find this at bit.ly slash paper drones, and it'll walk you through the process. The paper-based system requires you to fill out forms and submit them via mail. The new system doesn't support registration of small UAS used in connection with the business. However, the FAA says it will in the future, and they estimate spring 2016. For now, if you're going to fly for a business, you'll need to register using the paper-based process. Again, you'll find that details at bit.ly slash paper drones. If you visit this webpage, you'll find that there are several forms that are required to be filled out. It's a bit more cumbersome of a process, but it's your only path if you are flying for commercial use or flying a drone that weighs 55 pounds or more. All right, let's talk about the registration process. What does it take in order to get your device registered? This process is brand new and launched on December 21st, 2015. I'm going to walk you through the essentials, what it takes to get registered, as well as the actual mechanics of using the website. For the registration process, the new system is an online web-based tool. But if you prefer to do the older paper-based method, that's still an option. In order to use the online tool, you must be 13 years of age or older before you can register an unmanned aircraft. If the owner is less than 13 years of age, then they need a person who is at least 13 years to take advantage of the registration system. This means that if you buy a drone for a child who is under the age of 13, the adult or a sibling will need to register the device. Only United States citizens can register their small UAS. The certificate serves as a certificate of ownership for non-citizens, not a registration certificate. This means that if you are a United States citizen, you can properly register with this system. But even if you're going to visit the United States, you still need to actually register so that if there were an incident involving your drone, they'd be able to find you. Keep in mind that these new regulations are designed to apply to anyone who flies within the United States airspace. With the registration process, you can register your drone beginning on December 21st, 2015 at FAA.gov. 
If you purchased your drone before December 21st, you will have 60 days in order to be compliant with the new regulations. Any UAS operated before this date must be registered no later than February 19th, 2016. If you purchase a new device, it must be registered before you operate it outdoors. When you register, you must provide your complete name, a physical address, a mailing address, and a valid email address. The email address will become your login ID when you set up your new account. If you are a hobbyist, an individual recreation user, then you don't need to actually enter the make, model, or serial number. If you're flying for commercial use, you'll have to provide, you'll have to provide specific details about each device that you register. If you're a recreational user, you can register once and apply the same number to all of your UAS. What the FAA is saying here is that those who fly for hobby purposes simply need to register once. You can now use that number for three years and apply it to any of your drones, quadcopters, or model aircraft. If you add new devices within that three-year period, well, you can apply the same number to that device, using it more than once. But at the end of a three-year period, you're going to need to renew your registration. If you're going to use the paper-based system, they estimate it taking about 30 minutes. If you're able to use the online system, they estimate that this will take about five minutes. The bulk of the time, reading and acknowledging basic safety information presented during the registration process. This is part of the education efforts tied to the registration campaign. For a non-modeler registrant to establish an online account, they estimate that it's gonna take about seven minutes to register two aircrafts five minutes to establish the basic account, and then one minute per aircraft. Remember, if you are a non-modeler, you'll have to actually submit things like the make and serial number of the device. If you decide to deregister a device and cancel your registration or remove a particular device from the system because it has been rendered useless due to a crash or because you're gonna sell the unit, well, they estimate that that will take approximately three minutes per aircraft. Now, at this point, I just want to quickly review what the FAA considers a modeler or a hobbyist. These guidelines are meant to help people properly classify their use. I consider my use a hobbyist. I don't fly my aircraft professionally or to sell the footage that I create. However, if you are using a drone, quadcopter, or UAS for a business, they want you to register using the paper-based system, and there are substantially more advanced requirements that are currently in place. For a hobbyist, it is advised that you fly below 400 feet and remain clear of any surrounding obstacles, such as power lines or buildings. The aircraft must be within visual line of sight at all times. This means that you can't let it fly too far away from you and you can't see the device with the naked eye. This is important so your controller can properly control the device and so it doesn't hit something because you're not paying attention during flight. You also should stay very far away from any obstacles and make sure that you're not interfering with any manned aircraft operations. Don't fly near airports. Don't fly in busy airspace. The FAA asks that you don't fly within five miles of an airport unless you contact the airport and the control tower before you fly. Many manufacturers, in fact, have built-in GPS receivers, and if you try to take off within an airspace zone around an airport, the device might not even launch. This is a safety mechanism that's been built into many of the devices, and while older systems don't have it, you can expect that manufacturers are going to be more and more compliant with the regulations to avoid any potential risk associated with people using their devices. Be sure to avoid flying near people or stadiums. For example, don't fly over large crowds or sporting events. And don't fly an aircraft that weighs more than 55 pounds if you're considering this to be a model or a hobby. They caution you to not be careless or reckless with your unmanned aircraft. You can be fined for endangering people or other aircrafts. Now that you understand the general guidelines of what is a hobbyist, let's talk about the registration process. If you're not a hobbyist and you're going to fly, it is expected that you provide the make, model, and serial number when the website comes available. Remember, this is expected to be in the spring of 2016. 
You must also register and apply a unique registration number to all of your UAS devices. The guidelines that they also put out include things like the Section 333 exemption. This allows somebody to actually get a waiver to fly for commercial use in a low-risk controlled environment. You can find instructions available on FAA.gov. Additionally, you'll need a special airworthiness certificate that describes how the system is designed, constructed, and manufactured, and all of the systems involved. This also documents where you intend to fly and the procedures that you're going to follow to be safe. Now, this is a process that can be a bit time consuming, and it's also one that continues to evolve. Make sure you visit the FAA website if you're flying for commercial use and explore the current regulations. The cost of registration is pretty straightforward. Federal law requires any owner to pay $5 to register their aircraft. The FAA is required to charge a registration fee. They also use the credit card transaction to authenticate the user. This is one way to validate that the name and the address is truly associated with the person registering their device. The fee will also help pay for the cost associated with building the web-based registry system and for future improvements. If you're a hobbyist, you will pay $5 to register all aircrafts. Remember, you can use a single number on all of your devices. Non-hobbyists will be expected to pay $5 per aircraft. There is a short period of free registration. For the first 30 days of the system, the FAA has decided to waive the fee. This is until January 20th, 2016. Initially, you'll still need to pay with a credit card and you'll see a charge hit your credit card. Now, once you've gone ahead and actually processed the card, shortly after, a credit will appear to offset. Remember, this is only available during the first 30 days of the program. All right, with that in mind, let's go ahead and walk you through the registration process. To get started, you're going to need to visit bit.ly slash register a drone. Let's go ahead and visit that page. Once you visit faa.gov slash UAS slash registration, there's a pretty straightforward process. Let's go ahead and register our unmanned aircraft system and aircraft. After visiting faa.gov, slash UAS slash registration, you can scroll down towards the bottom. You'll see a button that's labeled register now. Note on this web page, you'll be presented with general information that tells you if you need to register. If you are flying for commercial purposes, go ahead and click register by paper. If you already have an account, you can log in. Otherwise, you can create a new account. Clicking Register My Drone will prompt you to create an account as well. If you don't have an account already, you'll need to create an account. You must be 13 years old in order to register. Enter your email address, as well as a password, and click Create Account. You'll now need to check the verification email in order to activate your account. Click the link in order to activate your account. You're now informed that you're accessing a government website make sure you read over the information about their policies and their privacy policies. When you're ready, click I agree. You can then log in. Once logged in, create a profile. You'll need to enter your name and address. When ready, click proceed to checkout. They ask you to confirm that you've read the safety guidelines. These are the same ones that we've discussed earlier in our training video. When ready, check the box that you agree to abide by the policies and click next. You'll now need to enter payment information. When ready, click Next. Review your information. Click the checkbox on the bottom to acknowledge that you are lawfully receiving this certificate to fly and that all the information you provided was accurate. When ready, click Pay. You'll now receive a confirmation number. I recommend that you either screen capture or print this screen for safety. The certificate should also be mailed to you but you can click right here to print it. There it is. And if I click the print button, it'll bring up the card and I could send that to my local printer or save it as a PDF to store on my electronic devices. You'll note in the future, if you click to view your profile, that you'll see your registration number along with the other details here on the screen about your particular craft. 
This is where you can also update your details if necessary. If I check my email, you'll note that you've likely received two additional emails. The first confirms that you have actually activated your account. The second contains your certificate. This can be printed as well, and you have the ability, of course, to click through to download it from the website. Be sure to save a copy of this email and an electronic copy of your certificate for safety. I also recommend making a printout and storing it with your devices. Go ahead and tape it right inside the case, and of course, take your number and mark that on your device. Back on this main screen here, when satisfied, I can click Done. You'll see that it loads your profile up if you need to view it or make any additional changes. Since we're all finished, I can click Close. Click Close. All right, now that the device is registered, let's talk about what comes next. After you've registered the device, there's a couple of things you're going to need to do. First up, you'll have a certificate of registration. The certificate of registration is available to download and will also be sent to your email address at the time of registration. When you operate your UAS, you must be able to present the certificate, either printed out or in an electronic format, if you are asked for proof of registration. This means that you need to keep a copy with you. I recommend making a printout, putting it right in your carrying case, as well as maybe putting a copy in your wallet or purse. Additionally, go ahead and save a PDF to your phone or tablet so you have an electronic copy. There are a lot of devices that can sync it so you don't need to have a cellular connection so it's permanently on your device. Perhaps use an ebook reader or something like that to store the PDF onside your electronic device. Additionally, anyone who operates your drone must have the certificate in their possession. So if you loan your drone out to somebody, they must have a copy as well. You can give them a paper copy, email it to them, or they can show the electronic version from the registration website. Keep in mind, the burden is on you. You're responsible for your device, so even if it's being operated by somebody else, they must have that with them. Additionally, with that certificate, you can go ahead and submit information to the registry. However, the FAA can only register aircraft that belong to a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident. So if you are visiting our country, you can still register, and that's good for a proof of registration. Anyone else who submits will be recognized as the owner of that device, which is great. This means if there's an incident or your device is lost, they'll be able to get in touch with you. This, however, does not mean that you are registered. Foreign nationals who have completed the recognition of ownership process may also receive a rebate for the $5. Simply contact the FAA after registration and request the refund. The FAA would like you to register your device or provide proof of ownership this way if you're going to fly in the United States. Additionally, registrants will need to provide their name, home address, and email address. Once you have done this, you will end up with the aircraft registration certificate or proof of ownership and this will give you that unique number for the UAS owner that must be marked on the aircraft. Let's talk about labeling the drone. You've got your quadcopter or UAS, you need to get it labeled. Now, the requirements state that it must be easily visible. This doesn't mean that you need to scrawl it across the top or that it has to be read from a great distance, but it does mean that they need to be able to get in touch with you. I've got a couple of recommendations on how to do this easily. First up, Take your unique number and mark the registration number by some means that's legible and allows it to be easily seen. This can also be placed in the battery compartment as long as it can be easily accessed. For example, let's do that now. Take something like a label maker and enter your registration number. When ready, you could print that out. Now, once you've got that printout, it can be placed in something like the battery compartment. There we go. Cut that off. We'll take the battery compartment here and slide the battery out. And you'll notice that right inside of there, there's some open areas. You can easily put it inside the surface. Take your label, reach inside, and affix. And now I can look inside and see my registration number. We'll just close that back up. The key here is that you need to affix the number 
with a permanent marker, a label, engraving, or something that makes it readily easy to be read. And it has to be accessible and maintained in a condition that holds up, so it can't fade over time. It must be readable and legible upon close inspection. This means that the person has to be looking for the number and that it is clear to read. Now, I recommend that you go ahead and take that number and attach it perhaps to your remote control and of course, keep a copy of your registration certificate. But remember, registration doesn't necessarily mean permission to operate. Just because you've completed the registration process doesn't mean that you are authorized to operate a UAS. Make sure you take a look at the FAA website, UAS FAQ, in order to see some of the requirements. The FAA is also developing an app and many manufacturers will have built-in software that will keep the device from flying in restricted airspace. Additionally, you should be careful of any local requirements or regulations tied to the property where you're flying. Another thing to keep in mind is that buildings typically have floors that are 12 to 14 feet high. This means that a 30 to 40 story building would be about 400 feet. Another good rule of thumb is if you can't see the aircraft, it's probably above 400 feet. Remember, those requirements that they want you to use for guidelines for hobbyists include flying below 400 feet, staying away from obstacles, keep the aircraft within your line of sight at all times, remain clear of any manned aircraft, don't fly within five miles of an airport unless you have specific permission, don't fly near people or stadiums. Don't fly an aircraft that weighs more than 55 pounds. And do not be reckless because you can be fined for endangering people or aircraft. Now, there's a lot to this and this is a moving target. I recommend if you're going to fly within the United States that you regularly visit the FAA website. This presentation was put together by visiting the FAA website and reading several additional documents that go into excessive detail about the new procedures. These include things that were presented to Congress and for public review, and they are many pages long. Feel free, if you'd like to learn more, to continue to dig deeper into these particular requirements for flying. But hopefully you can get your device registered and enjoy getting back to the air. My name's Rich Harrington. I hope you enjoy flying your quadcopter, UAS, or model aircraft for your own personal hobby and enjoyment. Remember, these new requirements from the FAA are meant to be enforced going forth into 2016. I strongly recommend you get familiar with them and become compliant. But of course, if you have any questions about the legality or how this affects you, I strongly recommend that you get in touch with your attorney. Thanks for watching.